Hello, good day and welcome back. So today we're gonna wrap up the IO package and not because there's nothing else to talk about in this package. As you'll see, there's a lot more we can talk about and we'll probably have at least six to 10 more sessions if we just keep going the way we've been going. But you don't wanna try and learn everything at one time. That's because one, you're not gonna use all of it as you start writing, especially if, you, if you're watching this, then you're probably fairly new to go language programming and you're not gonna use everything at one time. No language is that way. You never use everything at the same time. I'm sorry if that sounds repetitive or you, know, you already know it, but um, that is the case. And so it's worth mentioning for anybody else who's sort of new to programming or um, thing. Um, what you want to do is treat a language when you go through it the first couple of time as having a rough idea of what's available and what you can do with it and think of it like a toolbox. You sort of know what's in there and then when you want to do something, you kind of reach for it. The first time you're not going to do it the most efficient way and then eventually you might come back and go, hmm, you know what? Um, I think something like this is in there or something I, I need is in there. You can go look at it. So with all that said, let's just talk about it. So some of the other things in the IO packages um, I'm going to talk about, and we're not even probably going to look at the description or documentation for it because again, a number of things, and I only list some of them here. And so I encourage you to just set a, skim the documentation and have an idea. You already have an idea what's there. And then in the future, when you're looking to do things, go back and say, Hey, maybe there's something in there. Oh, I don't see a mistake already. Bite. There's a P here. All right, so um, so we're gonna take a look at byte reader, byte scanner, byte writer, and look at, talk about it. Closer, limited reader, um, pipe reader, pipe writer. We're not gonna talk about them directly, but we're gonna end up talking about them indirectly. Um, and so um, then we'll talk about methods, IO pipe, I, um, T reader, a multi-reader and we're gonna look at an example of, of two of those but we'll certainly spend more time talking about one of them more than the other so um, let's go back and jump right here into the documentation constant we don't really need to look at um, the variables we already looked at these these are the error messages that were predefined and we looked at copy as you can see there's copy buffer copy n and they pretty much exactly the same as copy as you can see it takes a reader and a writer and it writes from the read from the reader and write to the writer and then using a buffer as an intermediate or um, you can use specify in um, read at least read full self-explanatory so um, again um, thing we are, we looked at write string how to just take a string and have it put into a writer which looked very much like copy except that here instead of your reader you have a, a string and so um, and then these are type type byte reader type byte scanner and type writer so type reader the interface of that is um, for a reader interface it was just a read method here the byte reader is the read a byte and all it does is it takes no parameter and return a byte and so you might want to th implement this interface for something we want somebody to be able to just pick off one byte at a time and um, we don't have a need for it but there might be things that you might implement or in your project you might want to be able to just go through it one byte at a time uh, you could think of that as some, maybe something like a keyboard every time I type a key you know assuming that I'm generating ASCII characters I generate one byte at a time and so maybe I would want to read it that way um, byte scanner interface is actually the byte reader plus this on read byte method and basically the reason why it's a scanner is because imagine you have a stream with some data and you want to look for a particular set of bytes um, if you read all of it one time um, then you get to the end and you realize that what you're looking for is not there you would like to be able to just sort of pull off a few bytes and so maybe you do byte 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 look for what you want and it's not a sequence of bytes you want you want to put them back so you do on read bytes so allows you to back up sort of right and so of course since the reader has the data when you say on read byte it just means that you're backing up um, it, you have to give it back the byte because it's, it's not like it, lo it lost it when you read it okay and so we can see byte write is the same thing. Now it's allowing you to write one byte at a time. And so um, again, sometime you, you might want the ability to be able to do things like that. Okay, um, if you keep going down the list, we have this closer interface. And remember for our uh, mem store, we had a close method. And so where we say you can close, um, you know, 
access to this object where you couldn't write anymore or when it's closed you couldn't read and by default when you create one it's already open for reading and so there's a closer interface and this come in handy where you can have um, things that automatically call a closer for you now normally when you have something like a file you would read and then when you, before you you know your program finished you'd want to say close up and release any resources associated with this file in our own um, the thing that we held on to was a buffer and so maybe um, for us it, when we close we don't need to add, to release anything because we still want that day to day in case they say open again but if we decide to implement it in such a way that once you say close things are released then um, you know we might need to do some work in our close and so there's this read closer and it does exactly what you think it, do, it would do. It implements both the reader interface and the closer interface. So you can imagine that our mem store, because it implements the two methods, the reader method and the IO closer interface, it actually implements read closer. And so we could put pass our mem store to anything that wants a read closer because we also have those two interfaces um, implemented already. And then there's this read write closer. I mean, you know, reader closer is the interface that group the basic read, write, and closer method, right? It's exactly what you think it, it would do. Um, there's limited reader, and again, the limited reader is is just a um, a type that allows you to read a certain amount of bytes. Um, again, if we don't need um, anything like this. So if I click on limited reader here to read it, see the interface, it says that our limited reader is really a reader and this N. And so you might want this for um, if you have fixed size stuff that you're reading. So our person objects are variable size data. But let's say you have an audio packet. Um, you might actually, when I used to do audio pro, um, some DSP programming, you actually would sample um, audio for a few sec milliseconds and then package that and send it. So every packet was the same amount of data, data always. It's always a fixed length, okay? And so, because it represented like, uh, I think, 20 milliseconds of data or something. I can't remember now, a long time ago. So if you have the fixed um, length data, you might actually put a limited reader, and as you can see here, limited reader uh, would read at most n bytes, and then you know internally it would keep updating how many remain, how many remain, but it would always just read at most n. And of course, if there's less than n or something, then you return end of file because if you're expecting a full packet um, and you can't read that from the source, then that could be a problem, right? Um, then there's this pipe. Okay, let's go back here. Yep. So limit reader, and then there's a pipe reader. Um, the pipe reader, if you look at how the documentation is, this is just a function. It's not a, a method. It's a function in the I.O. package. And the only reason it's shown on the pipe reader is because it returns. So if a, there's a method, like here uh, we have this read that um, receives a limit reader, it's going to show up under this type. And if the method returns the type, then it shows up under the type definition. Whereas um, here you can see like read um, write string doesn't show up under the writer type because it accepts this as a parameter. It doesn't return it as a value, nor does it is not a method to receive one, right? Does that make sense? But if you look at the documentation, you kind of get when they put the method, when they put the functions or method under the type. If it either accepts it, then it's a it's reader, it's a method. If it returns it, then it they put it under the type. So here, if you call this pipe function, it will return to you a pipe reader and also a pipe writer. And um, here's pipe writer, and they should have put it under this again also using the same logic, but they didn't. And pipe reader and pipe writer, um, you know, you know, you could go look and see what they look like. Um, but pretty much the internals are hidden, but they look like readers and writers. And so we're going to take a look and see what a pipe reader and pipe writer look like. So let's come back here to our... Um, um, slides and so the IO pipe function um, creates a pipe for you and basically it connects an in-memory reader and writer so you don't have to write the memory the reader and the writer it has that implemented and it has them connected internally in such a way that when you write on one end of this pipe it is the data is immediately available because remember it's in memory 
immediately available for your destination to read from that pipe. So quite literally look at this as a one-way pipe where you can write on one end and think some out the other end. And you might be thinking this look like a channel. It sure does, right, doesn't it? And for the same rule with an unbuffer channel, excuse me, um, same thing with an unbuffer channel, if you try to write on one end and there's nothing to read on the other end, um, it blocks. And so same here with a pipe. If you think of a pipe and you try to push some stuff in on one end, it's gonna come out the other end, really short pipe. Um, so you wanna make sure that you hook this up in such a way. And so we're gonna look at an example of this. So let's go here and let's do CP minus R and we're gonna do section 13. We'll copy that code and we'll make a chapter 14, section 14 and let's go into 14 and we have the code from before. All right, so I'm gonna do code and then I'm gonna go into CLI so I can run that. And let's just move this up over here somewhere and then expand this somewhere, something like that. And let's do RM, make sure we don't have uh, any kind of old thing hanging around. And so what I'm gonna do is gonna come here and I want to be able to use chapter 14, stuff I'm pulling from 14, and um, example of, um, well, you know what? Um, let's make a directory. So I'm gonna back up here, I'm gonna say um, mkcd, mkcd, k directory change directory mkcd okay make directory and change to it and i'm going to call this pipe and so um, here's our pipe example and i have a new file i'm going to main that go and I'm going to do package main and do funk main as usual and fmt that print lin and then is example of io that pipe and so and so now what we can do is we can say let's imagine that we want to create a pipe now why would you want to create a pipe now assuming i had a function and let's call um, read stuff, right? And it expect a IO that reader, okay? This is what this function expects. And if I were to call this function uh, with a reader, what I want it to be able to do is to read some stuff from a buffer, from, from this reader. So I'm gonna say make a buffer of slice, come on, byte of 100. And I'm gonna say read that read it from this into this buffer buffer read into this buffer and then maybe i want to print it fmt that um print line and so f okay um percent v backslash whatever so now i have a way of if i call this function, it can read from that buffer and it prints it out, okay? Um, uh, printf, blah, blah, blah. So I think um, fmt, uh, that print, fmt, printf, uh, undefined fmt. Okay, uh, that's gonna get referred as, okay, print line. Okay, there we go. All right, so now let's create a pipe. So io.pipe, and if we look at this method, it says that it, returns two parameters, you just call it like this with no parameter and it returns a reader and a pipe, a reader and a writer, pipe reader and a pipe writer. So pipe reader, comma, pipe writer, colon, equal. So those are the two things it returns. So since this is a reader, and remember the picture that we have, that it creates a pipe and you can read from one end and write into the other end, that's the, the pipe here. So it's saying that, oh, hey, I give you two things, write into this end, and read from that other end. And so I can pass to my read stuff this pipe reader. 
and say, hey, you read from that end of the pipe. But I also still need to be able to write some data um, into the pipe. Now, remember what we said. Okay, so let's let's keep going. So this is going to try and read from the end of the pipe, from the end of the pipe. And now I should be able to write into the pipe. So one easy way to write some stuff into a pipe is to use our write string, right? Um, it can write a string to a writer. So we have a pipe writer, which is a writer. So I'm going to write a string, hello world, okay? And so if this is correct, then this should write the string into this writer. And then because this is a pipe, my read stuff should be able to read these same bytes that I wrote into one end of the pipe and print it out. Now, if I try to run this right now, it's going to run, go run, main, and it's going to tell me how it's deadlock. And it's because of what we said before. Um, we said that with a pipe, it's in memory. There's no buffering of data. As soon as I try to write on one end, it has to be available. Somebody has to be able to read. And we know that though, single threaded, we know from Go Routine, there's a Go Routine that's going to come and it's going to try to execute here and it's going to get to this part and it's going to be blocked here. And so because the Go Runtime is going to realize that, oh, I'm blocked here and there's nobody who is going to write any data into this pipe for me to, to proceed, it's detected as a deadlock. So what we really want to do is launch this read in a Go Routine, right? So let's do that. Let's run the read into a go routine. And I'm going to do that by wrapping this into a go routine. Right, come on. Um, I'm going to wrap this into a go routine. And we know how to do that. I'm going to say go, 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 funk. And so that's a go routine that I'm going to launch. A, um, you know, anonymous go routine. I create it and I launch it. I say go run that. And so it's going to be waiting now. So I have a separate Go Routine 2, if you like. So Go Routine 1, running this code, launch this Go Routine 2, which is sitting here trying to read some data. And then I could continue with Go Routine 1, and it's going to come here and write some data. Now, if we run this, I won't have a deadlock, right? But as you can see, um, example, read, um, read in, you know, thing. And so it read the bytes of what I tried to write. Now, there's a possibility that, you know, I wouldn't have been able to see anything, right? Because remember, uh, even though I have this Go routine waiting there, when I come here, write it, this main program could exit even before this Go routine um, get to write anything. So if you're running this and you don't get to see any output, just know that oh, it's because your main program is just finishing before your read stuff can get to um, read the data that's written, okay? Um, but remember, it's a pipe, so it should be able to write it right away. But just in case you don't see anything, just know that oh, that might be the case. Now, one of the other things you can do is because not only is this a pipe, um, this pipe is a read and writer, um, gives you read and write pipe, but they also can be closed. So you might want to be able to signal that after you've written some stuff into this pipe that you want to close it. So you might want to do um, pipe writer that close, for example, right? And so this says, oh, I'm finished writing. And that's so this pipe knows that uh, when you finish writing, it shouldn't wait for any more data. And um, that's just good practice. And now notice when I close the pipe, what happened? It, it's finished and it says, oh, I'm, the pipe is closed and I can't even see my output. But we know to fix that, right? We can say that I'm going to create a weight group. So I can say var weight group from the sync package that weight group. And then here, before I start, when I launch this go routine, before I go into call in the function, I could say um, weight group that add one, right? And now I can say after this function return, which means after it's finished um, reading the data, I can say pipe reader that close. So I can close the reader also. Nobody else can read from it. Then I can say wait group that done. All right to say I'm I'm done now. There I finished reading the data. I've closed the wait group. Now I'm done. And before we exit the program, now we can wait here and say wait group that wait. Um, 
we've done all this already so um if you're still confused a bit go back to i think chapter eight is where we did weight group with go routines and so on so definitely revisit that and to know when i run my program it works perfectly fine now why would i choose to do this with the closing and all this other stuff if it was working fine before without the closing remember what i said that sometimes um, you want to be able to close readers and writers to indicate that oh, you're finished with them. Sort of like oh, when we were using channels, we would say that you know we close the channel and so on. Um, and so definitely keep that in mind to, for cleaning up of resources because you don't know what kind of resources this pipe is actually holding on to. So if you finish with it, you should definitely start closing the readers and writers um, and not hanging on to just just keep hanging out to them. The, otherwise, that the go run time may not be able to clean them up if you just leave everything open. So that's a, a pipe, for example. All right, so um, I didn't need this, so let's delete that. So let's go back now and um, continue. So we look at the pipe. Um, read closer, we talk about that. Seeker and so on, you can look at that. Um, Read writer is just again the reader and the writer interface. Um, the other one I want to sort of um, show you is we looked at multi reader before, and so it just means that you read it. It's a nice way of concatenating data where you pass a number of readers, you get back what a reader, and then you could take that reader. Once you read from it, it starts reading from one reader in turn, okay? Until end one ends, then it goes to the next one. So T reader is interesting. Uh, T reader. You have a reader and a writer, you pass to the T reader, and it gives you back a reader. And so the way you want to think of that is, um, let's do this, let's create a new folder, and we're going to call this T reader, example, and new file, main.go, and we can do package main uh, font main and ffnt.println and Example of IO that uh, T reader. Okay, and so what does it ask for? It asks for a reader and a writer. So let's do just that. Let's um, create a. We have something that can be a reader and a writer. So let's create a um, a M source colon equals to ms that new and we're gonna say it's 100 for example it doesn't really matter and so what we're gonna do is let's use from 14 because that's where we are and what we're gonna do is we're gonna say um, io that write string are we gonna write some string into ms source okay and let's write Right, to write a string into our source. Now, let's do m destination colon equals to ms dot new, and we can make this whatever. It doesn't really matter. So we have a destination. Now, one thing we can do if we want the data from source to go into destination is simply use io dot copy, and we can say copy from our uh, into our destination m destination into m destination from m source we know we can do that but we want a t reader what does this allow us to do well let's look at a picture first so with our t reader what we want is we have some source like ms source which is going to form our reader and we create a t reader and we give to the t reader function the source and our destination and it returns back to us another reader which looks like a source to us and so when we read from source two, which is T reader function returns to us, what it does is it, it's acting like a man in the middle because it goes to our source, does the read, write it to our destination, and also give us the same data. So you can imagine it's a way of us duplicating the data that we read from our source because if we read 10 bytes here, we get those 10 bytes plus those 10 bytes end up in our, in our destination. So this path from source one, R1 to W, looks like a copy, doesn't it, right? It looks like we copy it from source to destination, but in addition to that, we are also getting a copy of the data. So what we can do is say we have a T reader, and um, 
let's look at the signature of this function. It says read from R and write to W. So we need this to be turned around. So we need M source to be first. This is our where our reader and write to W our destination. Okay, looking at our picture, we want to read from source and then write to our destination. And so this is our source and going to our destination. So this looks like a copy, but except this returns a another reader. Right? And so now we can use this reader. We can say buff colon equals make a buffer of bytes, you know, a hundred or whatever you want. And then I can say R that read into this buffer. Right? And then now I can do um, FMT that print len and I can do buff and I can do FMT that print len and I can do M destination. So I can print out my destination also. These two should have the exact same data because when I try to read, when I try to read here into this buffer, that should have resulted in whatever data went through to my buffer also went through my destination because I'm using this reader that the T reader um, returned. And so if I do this, well, I don't need to, um, okay, let me do this. Um, if I go here, I want to show you that only until I did a read here, then I had data in my destination. If even when I created a T reader here, it doesn't populate any, my destination anything. So let's run. So go run. Um, okay. Um, I don't need to be in the pipe directory. Uh, CD T reader. Uh, so I go run main. And as you can see here, my mem store is empty. And then my buffer, I have this amount of data in my buffer because um, I use a 200 bytes buffer, 100 bytes buffer, right? And then in my mem store, I only use, even though the capacity is 200, um, I only use 18 bytes. So you can see both have the same um, data. And so that's a T reader for you. It's a nice way of getting in the middle of a copy if you wanted to duplicate the data that you're reading. So you can also have a copy of it. So this is really nice. And now you use this this T reader, um, this reader that you got from T reader, and you could call T reader again with yet another, with this reader too, and another destination. And now the second, the third reader that you get, when you read from that, it would pull the data from the one source into multiple destinations. So you can really go crazy. All right. All right. So I don't want this video to be too long. The next one is the multi writer. So just like the multi reader, where it allows you to specify a number of readers, and then when you read from it, it reads from all them in uh, thing. Multi writer is slightly different. You specify a number of writers, and then it gives you back one writer and a new writer. When you write to that writer, it duplicates the result to um, thing. So you want to actually think of this as a T function. Now, if you're not familiar with a T function from Unix, um, this is what it, that looks like. So um, let's say I have the echo command, which allows me to echo anything to the screen. So hello. Okay, so that's just echo it to standard out, which is what you're seeing which is my terminal has standard in when I type and standard out when it displays something, okay? That's, we're gonna learn about standard in and standard out pretty soon. And so one of the things I can do though, is I can rewrite, redirect this into a file. So I call it file.txt. And so now when I check the file, it's there. But notice when I redirect it to a file, nothing was printed to my standard out. That's because I redirected it to a file. Now when I did cat file, it read the file and <laughs> Redirect and put it on my and sent it to standard out. So another thing I can do is say echo, or even with with cat, I can say read it from the file, and you know, pipe it mm -hmm. to um, t. This command called t, and t allows you to say specify number of one or more files or destination in addition to standard out. So if I say pipe it to file one, the txt, when I do that, 
you can see I get the output of what cat sent to T and my standard out, but it also went to this file, file one, right? So let's try another example. So I'm gonna say echo, echo, whole, um, high. And I'm gonna pipe it to T, and I'm gonna say write it to a file W1, W, W2, W3, W4, W5. I can keep going. And now I enter. And so I see the output here in standard out, because remember, T is always gonna send it to standard out, of course, unless you redirect it standard out to another file or somewhere else. But look at this, I have all these files W whatever, and if I do cat W star, you can see high was written to all of them. So T duplicated the one input it had into all these different things. And so here, the multi-writer is the same way. It essentially says, I have all these places I wanna write data, and I'm going to create a multi-writer which returns to me W, so I have, I give the multi-writer W1, W2, W3, or how many, and it gives me back W with a single writer. And when I write to it, my data appears in all those other places. So it, this is very similar to the T command in Unix. And um, I'm not gonna go through and write an example because it's just as straightforward as, as you see here. I mean, oh, and there's an example here also. So um, I'm gonna wrap this up here. Um, see you in the next video when we're gonna go to a new chapter. It was fun looking at the IO standard package. I think this was awesome. It sets up to look at some, some really cool things coming up in the uh, several other chapters, and especially in the next chapter. So thanks again for your time. Thumbs up if you would please. And um, see you. Subscribe. Take care.